I want to thank everybody uh, right off the bat for being here today. Um, when I first started talking about disability and accessibility when I was very, very young, back in elementary school, uh, we would never see crowds like this in a room. Uh, I was used to speaking to empty rooms uh, when I first started talking because a lot of people would say, well, disability, that has nothing to do with me. I'm not disabled. I don't need to worry about that. That's somebody else's problem. Uh, I think that when we look in the room today, what we see is that that narrative is changing, uh, that people are becoming to realize that disability is not an exclusive group of people with exclusive special needs, but rather that disability is something that touches all of us in lots of different ways. Um, as I like to start my first year class, Disability Studies 1010, uh, if you are not disabled yet, you will be at some point in your life. We are coming for you. We will find you. <laughs> You will join us, whether you like it or not. And we promise that we will be friendly and nice and kind and help you during that time, whether it's temporary or long term. You will be welcome. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about universal design and accessibility experience. Because disability studies is a field of study that's really rooted on personal narrative, I'm going to tell you a lot of stories about my own experiences growing up as somebody with a physical disability and moving my way through uh, like all the education possible, basically. Um, so we start our tale back in time, back in the summer of 1983. And this is a story that many of you have probably heard me speak of about before, if you've ever heard me talk. Uh, 1983 was the summer that I was born, uh, many years ago, getting further away from it, every presentation I give. And it was at that time that my mom realized, my, oh, there we go, annotations are going slow. Great example of why UDL still needs work. We're trying, but as you'll notice, the captions are not going to always be correct. Uh, PowerPoint captions are not the best and definitely shouldn't rely on them. But I figured better than nothing. Oh, no, not available right now. That's okay. Okay, here we go. So summer of 1983 is the year that I was born. It was at that time that my parents uh, brought me home and realized very early on that something wasn't quite right. They took me to the doctor, they started doing tests, and at about three months old, I was diagnosed with an unknown version of muscular dystrophy. Uh, so they called it congenital muscular dystrophy, sort of wiped their hands, said, all right, we're good to go, brought the parents in, sat my parents down, and explained to them that in no uncertain terms, their son would be different. They were told that their son had a physical disability, that their son would never walk, that he would never run, he would struggle to play. They were told that he would struggle in school, that he would likely lose all of his friends by the time he hit puberty, that he likely wouldn't graduate high school. If he did, he likely would not go to university or college, that he would likely never have a job, that he would likely never move out of their house, that he would be dependent on them forever because he has muscular dystrophy. They were told at that time that that was actually the good news. That was the best case scenario, that more than likely somebody like myself, diagnosed at this age, likely wouldn't live past the age of four. And so the best solution was take him home, love him, and wait for the inevitable end. This was the prognosis that was placed in front of my parents, the way that my life was supposed to go. Now, spoiler alert, <laughs> they were wrong. <laughs> Very, very wrong. Very, very, very wrong. I don't know why my parents did what they did. Um, I've long suspected both of my parents, I don't say this very often, but both of my parents were born and raised in the United States of America. And like all good Americans, they're extremely stubborn people and very suspicious of medical science. <laughs> For some reason, they didn't think that this would make any sense. They didn't understand why the inability to walk, the inability to lift things with your arms would have anything to do with succeeding in school, would have anything to do with getting a job, would have anything to do with making friends. After all, I would imagine that most of you don't measure the calves of your friends, <laughs> just to make sure. Now it's like, no, I'm sorry, Sally, you skipped too many leg days. We cannot be friends. Out they go, I suppose. I imagine that's not a thing, not really. But it brings us to a really interesting question, a really difficult question to answer. What is disability? 
Now, I would imagine that most of you, when you entered the room today, you were like, I totally know what disability is. That is an easy thing to, to, define, to define. And you probably didn't think that I would then demand you define it for me right now, which is exactly what I'm going to do and put you on the spot. So what is disability? What is it? How do we define it? A hush falls over the crowd. <laughs> How do we define it? There's no worry about being offensive here. It's all good. How do we define it? What are the words that are coming in your mind right now? Yeah. Um, I think most people associate like physical and mental incapability. Right. Um, right. So sort of physical limitations, maybe mental, cognitive, perhaps. Yeah. An individual who has abilities that don't fall within the like sphere of the normal that's been determined by society. Right. So those were sort of outside of the normal expectation of human form and ability, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I see it kind of like as a, a mismatch of individual and environment. That's what creates it. Interesting. Right. So a mismatch of, of the individual, the environment. So I hand back here. Yeah. Um, someone with cognitive physical limitations that might require accommodations to help them achieve the same result as maybe the average person that doesn't have those limitations. Right, right. It sounds like a set it policy. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. When we look out into the world, what we see is this very important, very powerful dichotomy or a duality. We have this imagination that in our world exists normal. That there is a normal person that exists. And I would imagine that most of you in this room today, if not all, believe yourselves to be normal. I'm sorry to say that is not true. <laughs> and you are delusional to believe that. <laughs> Which in and of itself might make you disabled. <laughs> we imagine that we start as normal and that we become disabled through some sort of incident. Something happens and you become disabled, perhaps an illness or an injury, a genetic defect, that you were normal and you cease to be normal. Between the poles of the normal and the disabled then, we have this gray area in the middle where we place people that are sick, uh, that are ill in some way, not quite normal, not quite fully disabled, somewhere in the middle. They may have limitations now, but we believe that sick will get better. Your cold will go away eventually. There is promise or hope that things will get better. The disabled, though, live outside of this norm, closer in proximity to death than to life. We associate disability with death. We associate normal with life, with living, happy, good, normal. This is perhaps why a very common compliment that I get which is really strange to me. Uh, people, if they haven't seen me for a while, they'll often say, you look so good. Which I'm like, well, I know. <laughs> I have a lovely summer beard happening right now. I look like I'm ready for grade eight prom. <laughs> I think that what they're really talking about here, of course, is not you look very handsome, you're a very sexy man. I think probably what they really mean is you don't look like you're dying. Or you look less like you are dying than the last time I saw you, perhaps. And I say it's because I'm no longer a grad student. <laughs> we believe that the disabled are sick, suffering, that they live hard, bad lives, that they are disabled, that they are unable, they lack in ability. We then are compelled to do something about it. We say that if disabled people are suffering, if they're unable, if there are things that they cannot do, then we must intervene. And we're left then at an important crossroads for the field of disability studies, which is an even harder question perhaps for you to answer. What causes disability? Many of us would place the cause of disability within the body. We would say, my disability is muscular dystrophy, which now has a name. I forgot that part. Uh, RYR1. Great name for a disability. Um, <laughs> something to do with genetics. We would say that muscular dystrophy is my disablement. That is what disables me. <coughs> but what if 
that is not true? Or what if it is not the whole truth? Am I disabled by my genetic code? Or am I disabled by a world that does not imagine that wheelchair users will navigate it? Am I disabled by muscular dystrophy? Or am I disabled by UC Hill? Am I disabled by muscular dystrophy? Or am I disabled by the fact that we still build classrooms that don't expect a wheelchair user to be behind the lectern? Are we disabled by internal factors? Or are we disabled by the discrimination, the inaccessibility, or the outright disregard for the needs of disabled people. This is the foundation of what is called the social model of disability, or the societal model of disability. Disabled by society, not with a disability. This informs my use today, for the rest of this presentation, of the term disabled people, disabled students, not people with disabilities. It's not that I find people with disabilities an offensive term. I don't have any problem when people use it. But I use the term disabled people politically and intentionally. I am not with muscular dystrophy. I am disabled by society. This is the way that I see the world. And I'm absolutely happy if you see the world differently. I have no problem if you want to see the person first, to see the person and not the limitation. I think that's progress too but it's not the progress that I personally am fighting for. Why this question is important is because it leads us down very specific pathways about how to fix people or problems. Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. And if anybody wants these slides, uh, just send me an email, jeff.preston.uw.ca. I will send them along. Um, all good, all good. If we believe that disability comes from within the individual, of course we then believe that it is the disabled person themselves who must change. The idea is that we need to intervene medically. We need to research cures or treatments. The idea is that we should intervene therapeutically through things like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, through things like physical therapy, or that we need to provide adaptive devices to allow them to augment their lack of ability. A wheelchair, great example of an adaptive device, but not the only kind. How many of you need a calculator to do math? I would guess. If you did not put your hand up, you are a liar. <laughs> a dirty, dirty liar. I just put my hand up too. Terrible at math. What is a calculator? It's an adaptive device, a device that augments a limitation that we have in that we don't care enough about math to learn how to do it in our mind, essentially. The social model though says maybe that's not quite right, because after all, if we see the disabled person as the problem, we then are compelled to get expertise, to wrap around the disabled people to resolve their issue. We do for the disabled, as opposed to doing with. But if the problem itself is perhaps not inside the person, then how does that change our intervention? We would say that not the person that needs to change, but perhaps it's the policy that prevents the individual from being included that needs to change. Perhaps it's the environment itself. Rooms like this that have moving chairs, moving tables, a great example of social model thinking. Let's not place the disabled person at the disabled table. Let's make all tables accessible for all people that can be moved. Perhaps it means we need to change the attitude to change the attitude that just because you're not in a wheelchair does not mean you do not have a disability. To change the attitude that just because you're not in a wheelchair does not mean you do not need accommodation within the classroom. To do this work, though, it means we need to bring disability into the center of the conversation to do with disabled people, not just for. This is an important philosophical turn that we need to make as a society, to not just do better for disabled people, but in my argument, to make things easier for us to do better for disabled people. The ways that we have done things for so long have aligned with the individual model. And the individual model, in terms of a wheelchair, for instance, makes a lot of sense, tons of sense. It is not universally bad. But think about the number of times that you have contorted yourself that you have been bound up 
by this problem of how do I fix the person when the problem itself perhaps lies outside of them. This slows us down and it leads us into individualized solutions that helps one person as opposed to broad solutions that help everyone who comes after them. Now again, spoiler alert, I am a person who has a defined disability. I've had it my entire life. I was diagnosed at three months old. And so I was a disabled student my entire life. I still am, I think, in some ways, a disabled student. Uh, and I'm still learning. We all still are. And things didn't go super great, I would say, throughout my life. Uh, and I do want to remind you, part of the reason why I said 1983, I want you to know that I'm not a dinosaur. Um, I am young. And these things like just happened like within the last 30 years. We're not talking ancient history here. But I do want to share some of my experiences and the ways in which we did things not so great and the ways in which we did things actually a lot better throughout my time. So they're not so great. Um, throughout elementary school uh, and high school, it was known that I would need an educational assistant, an EA, who would support my day-to-day -day needs in the classroom, outside of the classroom, while at school. Whether it's setting things up, getting books for me, uh, helping out with the washroom, etc. Now at the time when I entered elementary school, under the Education Act here in Ontario, it stated that if I wanted EA care, I needed to be a member of, enrolled in, the special education classroom at my school. Meaning, much like the doctors predicted, that I would not be able to go to college or university. I would not have the classes in order to do it. I would be in special ed, essentially. We fought that. Uh, we fought that hard, and luckily, uh, by grade one, we were able to get past that uh, through some creative uh, maneuvering, also known as calling a lawyer, and, um, and suddenly I was in a mainstream classroom with my EA. Despite that, I was always marked as one of the disabled kids during my time at school. I was in a mainstream classroom, yes, but I was different than my peers. I rode the small bus, the special bus, the short bus, as it's sometimes called, to and from school, where I made some amazing friends with other students that had disabilities, um, almost all of them, actually no, all of them, being members of the special education class. I did not take classes with them, but I formed friendships as we rode on the bus. But riding the special bus meant that I needed special accommodation. It meant that I had to leave class early because the special bus had to get out of the way for the regular buses. There were often times that I would arrive home before classes had even ended. Um, that's how early I would sometimes have to leave. Not that I complained about it as a child. <laughs> Often I was required to sit with the other disabled kids during the assemblies. There was no ability for me to sit with my classmates because I'd be in this giant wheelchair. They'd all be sitting on the gym floor. So I was placed with the other wheelchairs at the back of the room. The only accessible washroom as well was in the special ed classroom. Uh, this is both in elementary school and high school, meaning that if I had to go to the washroom, I had to leave class, go to the special ed room, find my EA, and then access the space. This was simply easier for them. Easier to produce an individual bathroom that fit my needs, as opposed to making sure that all bathrooms would fit my needs. I've often wondered what types of things I missed out on in the bathrooms. Bathrooms are not typically thought of as a social space, but they're absolutely a social space. For the better and for worse. I wonder what it would be like to get a swirly. <laughs> For some reason, my EA wouldn't do it for me. <laughs> Gym class was always a problem, a huge problem, throughout my elementary school because I'm disabled. Why would I do gym? That doesn't make any sense. But they had to do something for me. The solution was that I would do my own gym class in which I would sit out in the hallway and I would be assigned a student from my class who would then play with me during the gym class. And we would rotate through the roster of students so everyone got a chance to play with Jeff during gym. This was an odd solution because it meant that I didn't get any exposure to any of the gym activities that typically happen during gym class. It also meant that I had to spend regularly an hour or an hour and a half, depending on the class time, with someone who bullied me, for instance, someone who did not like me. Sometimes I got to spend with my friends, but it was rotated 
for the fairness to other students. So I have vivid memories of spending quiet hours with those who didn't like me and were very happy to tell me that. Not because I was in a wheelchair, I was a nerd, <laughs> and I was a police officer's son, so it's kind of an intersection of things. <laughs> There also wasn't accessible transit. That yes, there was the short bus, but the short bus was not allowed to be used for exterior to school things. Meaning that if I wanted to go on any class field trip, my parents were required to provide an accessible vehicle for me to get there. Again, this meant missing out on those fun long rides to Toronto or the OAC, where friendships are strengthened, where relationships happen, where some dating starts and ends by the time the bus starts and <laughs> by the time it ends. Not only that, but I also was required to use a special table. None of the tables in my school were really worked for me. And so as a result, I was provided with uh, this portable, it was not portable, it sort of looked like this, but it wasn't put together. So before and after every class, I would have to set it up, get all my stuff onto it, use it, take my stuff off, break it down, and then move on to the next class. This is because I used a laptop to write with, so I needed to be near a plug. And the desk was fairly large, which meant that there was only really one spot in each classroom where there was a plug and where the desk would fit. And that often meant it was not where the other students were sitting. So I would sit alone, sometimes with one or maybe two other desks near me, um, which they would also sometimes rotate people through uh, as though it was some special privilege to sit with me, um, which it was. <laughs> Great sense of humor. And then always sitting at the front, always being watched by the teacher, not being able to hide in the back like I always kind of wanted to do. In high school, it meant leaving class early because in order to get me from one classroom to another, hallways fill with backpacks and smelly boys. And so uh, I would leave class early. As I start to think about it, I'm leaving class early to catch my bus. I'm leaving class early to uh, move to the next class. I'm starting to wonder how much class I'm actually missing out on. And in fact, there's another little interesting factor, which is that typically sex ed provided in gym classes. So after elementary school, I no longer had sex ed. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Thankful, well, that's not true, I have the internet. <laughs> but that's all it's for, really. I had no idea, though. No idea. I missed out on many of those really important conversations important conversations about being safe, important conversations about rights. This is an experience that is replicated for many, many, many people with disabilities in Ontario. In fact, those with intellectual disabilities, there's often a fight to prevent them from getting sex ed. The belief being that it's better that they don't know, because if they know, they'll want to try. Spoiler alert, they're going to try, whether they know or not. I then arrived at university, and things changed a little bit. Suddenly I didn't hate school so much. It didn't suck as much as high school, elementary school. Maybe it's because I was at Western. Probably because I was at Western <laughs> in a lot of ways. At the same time, there were still some difficulties. For instance, exam accommodation was still seen very much as a special privilege. An important note, almost all of my professors were extremely supportive of my requests and needs. Most of my professors, very much so, were happy to support me in any way that I required, in any way that I requested. But what does that mean that I got a free pass, that my needs were never questioned, despite the fact that professors continue to request additional documentation, further notes, mass suspicion of those who have non-apparent disabilities? How do we draw this line? so firmly, and why? Some things that I was told during my time in university in relation to exam accommodation, I was told, if you cannot do it like other students, then really, should you be here? I was once told, university is a privilege, it is not a right. It shouldn't be for everyone. I was told that accommodations just make it easier for you. How is that fair for the other students? Also, of course, because I have a compromised immune system, the most likely time for me to get sick is at the change of seasons, which is exactly when we place university exams. 
Not to mention, the university campus is quite literally a biohazard zone <laughs> and should never be entered without a full hazmat suit. <laughs> Students in universities, like Western, are very generous with their germs. I caught everything. I got pneumonia every year, at least once during an exam period. I would regularly need to take my exam and shift it into either the summer or into January. So rather than getting ready to start a new term, I was writing makeup exams, still finishing off the work from previously. I also got shingles once. Apparently that's a thing that just happens. Um, that was fun, <laughs> really fun. It also made though for a real trouble when it came to pop exams or pop quizzes. Because after all, I needed a keyboard to type. I needed a keyboard to write. This was a bit of a problem. How do you have an exam that you're not supposed to know about when it happens? Typically what this meant was that either the professor would need to tell me in advance and I would book with SSD and that's how we would do it, but then I would know when the tests were so they weren't pop quiz, so is it still fair? Is it the same? Am I in special treatment? Or the pop quiz would happen, I would have to leave the room, and then I would book with SSD to write it at a later time, which wasn't ideal either. I regularly miss classes because of a lack of transit uh, here at Western. Uh, in my first year, I went one week where I said I would only go if the accessible vehicle picked me up. I had 15 hours of class that week. I made it to two. Two hours because I refused to walk through the snow again by myself, get stuck again by myself. We have a new system here, the Western Access Van, and that never happened again after that service was implemented. There was also a major lack of seating, of course. Many of our classrooms here at Western Design were seated in either the front or at the back. Those were sort of my new choices. I didn't really have the opportunity to choose where I would sit. I did have the opportunity finally to sit with my friends, but there were some rooms that didn't have any, class, any seats at all that would work for me. What it meant uh, was that regularly I had a little Palm Pilot with a keyboard, I'd have it on my lap, and that's how I would do my classes. That's how I would take my notes. Um, so if there was ever a worksheet that required handwriting, that was always a huge problem because I didn't actually have a table necessarily to work on. It was an issue, a huge, huge issue. There were also inaccessibility issues though outside of the university. There was one instance in which I was placed into a group and the group was required to watch a movie. Um, one of the group members uh, liked to host parties, I guess, that was a big thing for them. They really wanted to host it but their apartment was not accessible. In fact, no one's apartment in my group was wheelchair accessible. I was the only one that had access. This ended up leading to a confrontation because the student didn't understand why they would not be allowed to host this movie night simply because I wasn't able to come. They felt it would just make way more sense if I just watched the movie on my own and then the rest of my group members would get together and have a little celebration party and watch the movie together where I would not be able to go. This, of course, caused some friction. Uh, there was a fight, a major fight. The teacher was eventually made involved, and the group was dissolved. Is there any other way to manage this, though? How do we manage the situation in which the spaces outside of the school are not accessible? We can control what happens here, but what about out there? And how does that integrate within the university experience that we're trying to provide? Things were not all terrible, having said that. In fact, some things went extremely, extremely well. And I want to share you a couple examples of where things went amazing for me. When I was in grade four, uh, I was really struggling in math. As I said, I'm really bad at math. Um, I was really, really struggling. And it was determined uh, by actually a very clever teacher that I had. She realized that I was really slow at completing the math equations, that I wasn't getting homework done on time, I was spending way more time doing things than other students. And she realized that it didn't make sense that if I write on a laptop, why am I doing math with a pen? Now this was like in the 90s, so technology was not what it is today. But the, the teacher had a brilliant idea, which was, why don't I photocopy all of the worksheets, all of the sheets in the book, that have all the sample questions. And that way, Jeff only has to write the answer. After all, he's not learning anything by writing two and plus 
and divide over and over and over and over again. The benefit of doing practice questions is the answer, not the mechanical writing. So that's what we started doing. And suddenly I caught up to many of my peers. I was able to do it faster because I wasn't cramping my hand writing something that I really struggle with. This worked out really well. There was also a success in gym class, one success. I really like playing hockey. I play for the electric wheelchair hockey team here in London. I started when I was in grade seven. And my teacher at the time was really interested in this. He thought that was so cool that I was playing wheelchair hockey with all these other people in London. And I think he felt bad maybe that I didn't have that opportunity to play back in Port Elgin where I grew up, where there really weren't other people in wheelchairs, uh, certainly not like me. And so for one day, he had a brilliant idea. What if we put all the students on those little scooter boards, we give them mini sticks, and we play hockey. But Jeff gets his electric wheelchair. Jeff gets his hockey stick. So Jeff is now faster, stronger, <laughs> taller, and can reach further than all of his classmates. Suddenly Jeff is the first one to get picked when teams <laughs> are being picked. And I was an animal, <laughs> just an absolute beast. Knocking people down, 350 pounds of battery and metal <laughs> bearing down on these little grade sevens. The highlight of my educational career. It's a great time. I suddenly started making friends on the team. I started interacting with people that I'd never really actually interacted with before because of the ways that we get really cliquey in school. I was seen as having athletic ability, an ability that was presumed to not have simply by changing everything else, and not just me. When I got to university, uh, I suddenly realized that there's this thing called technology. Uh, I think actually professors realized that. Uh, and professors started using PowerPoint. And not only that, but many professors at request were fully willing to provide me with PowerPoint slides. This made note taking so much easier. I no longer had to record all the stuff off the screen. That was already there. I just had to annotate and add my own additional information. This was hugely helpful. Similar to the math example, it reduced the inefficiency of merely rote recording and allowed me to spend more time thinking about the ideas and adding my own thoughts in, rather than simply trying to keep up. My other good experience, and I'm actually, full disclosure, I did not know she was going to be here today. Uh -huh. But the other good experience I had was getting connected with uh, SSD here at Western early. Um, I came here and met Wendy, tried not to embarrass her. Um, I met Wendy when I was in grade 11, and we started working together, Wendy, the rest of Western, my family, for three years to get things lined up. When I arrived here, I thought we were gonna be talking about who was gonna set up my stupid portable table and where the one accessible bathroom would be. But Wendy actually had more insight on what it was like to be a student with a disability. She had expertise in that that was actually really valuable and said, here are 50 things you have never thought about that you're gonna to need to know what the answer is to by September and we're gonna work on that together. It was because of the strength of the group here in SSD that I was able to hit the ground running when I arrived at Western, that everything was set up, that when I had a problem, I knew I had an advocate that was within the university, that was willing to speak to people that had money and power. <laughs> I don't know why they did, now that I understand how things actually kind of work. I should have been talking to the people with tenure, maybe. Um, perhaps. Am I saying we need tenure for SSD? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. SSD was critical in helping me to set up timelines, to move me out of buildings. One of the first things I learned as I enrolled in Western, Kresge building is your enemy, avoid it like the plague. And I did, I've never been in that building. Still, all these years later, I have no idea what it's like inside. Probably not nice. <laughs> they helped me set up uh, documentation to support me when I did need to ask for accommodation. They helped me to set up different ways of working through school. They helped me to work with the library to be able to find books, to be able to get things. There was an infrastructure here that was ready to work toward helping me do the things that I wanted to do in the ways that I needed to do them. That was unique. And that's not just unique, I think, to like universities versus elementary schools or high schools. 
That's actually something kind of unique to Western. I went and looked at a lot of universities when I was in, in my uh, high school years. I visited a lot of universities. Um, I chose Western because it was the best situated to support my needs. Despite the fact everyone told me to go to Carleton. That's what you tell people in a wheelchair. You're like, you should go to Carleton. It's a thing. I don't know why. It's a thing. It's the tunnels, I guess. I don't know. I chose Western. And obviously, in my opinion, I made the right choice. I also got rejected from the one school that I went and visited, and they said, we don't have the ability to support someone like you. You probably shouldn't go here. It's the only school I didn't get into. I wanted to fight it. My mom said, no, because if you win, then you have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatic woman. All of this leads us then to this discussion around universal design, that ultimately, we need to think differently about our classroom spaces. We need to think differently about the ways in which we do education. We have to stop thinking so much about special needs and start thinking more about everyone's needs. To let go of the requirement for documentation and to understand and agree that disabled people are experts in their own needs because they have been living it their entire life. They are the experts you should talk to. Now, I was going to talk all about CAST, um, but that's boring, so I don't want to do that. Um, but CAST.org, uh, this is sort of like the North American standard in UDL. Uh, they have so much information on their website, so many ways of thinking differently about the classroom. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it is incredible. There's tons of stuff, very cool stuff. CAST.org, C-A-S-T dot org. Um, lots and lots of great stuff. And they update, so this is their sort of broad rubric that you use to work your way through their, their, their guidelines to make classrooms more accessible, not just to disabled students, to all students. They sort of have dropped that part of their requirement out. It's not about disability anymore. It's about making better learners, being better teachers for all people. Uh, and they update these standards regularly. Uh, it's all based on research that they've been doing in their center uh, in Massachusetts, and, uh, and it's very cool stuff. But uh, it bores me. So uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about something better instead. Um, I wanted to bring a bit of a different perspective to this conversation. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about open access, uh, done by a, uh, an artist, actually, uh, Carmen um, Papalia, um, who brings us a different perspective on thinking about universal design. Uh, Carmen is a, a blind performative artist. Um, the image here, uh, he does lots of very cool things. Uh, most notably, uh, he likes to play with sight canes. Um, he is blind, and he thinks about the ways in which canes speak his identity to people. That you see the white cane, and it's saying, I'm blind, I'm blind. So he's been thinking about how to do that differently. So for instance, uh, in the image, uh, he went out, uh, I'm not sure where he did this, but he went out with a megaphone uh, and instead used a megaphone instead of a sight cane. So as you can see here, he's walking down the street saying, I can't see you, I can't see you, I can't see you. Um, he then found you when he had to cross the street, he would megaphone, I need help crossing the street. Someone help me cross the street. Um, he also did a, an experience where he had a high school marching band and they were his sight cane. So they like played different tones and stuff to navigate through. Um, very, very funny guy, uh, great sense of humor. He was really interested in considering the ways in which we make art spaces, galleries, museums, etc., more accessible to diverse needs. And born out of his artistic practice, he developed what he calls the five tenets of open access. Rather than developing a specific set of rules, like doorway widths or space between resting seats, etc., he instead thought about looking at the accessibility done better through the concepts of disability justice. And it is these five tenets that he has developed. He states that open access, genuine open access, is number one. Open access relies on those present, what their needs are and how they can find support with each other and in their community. It is a perpetual negotiation of trust between those who practice support as a mutual exchange. He says that open access is radically different than a set of policies that is enforced in order to facilitate a common experience for a group of people with definitive needs. 
that it acknowledges that everyone carries a body of local knowledge and is an expert in their own right. He says that open access is the root system of embodied learning. It cultivates trust among those involved and enables each member of, to self-identify and occupy a point of orientation that is based in complex embodiment. He says that open access disrupts the disabling conditions that limit one's agency and potential to thrive. It reimagines normalcy as a continuum of embodiments, identities, realities, and learning styles. It operates under the tenet that interdependence is central to a radical restructuring of power, and that open access is temporary, collectively held space where participants can find comfort in disclosing their needs and preferences with one another. It is a responsive support network that adapts as needs are available, sorry, adapts as needs and available resources change. I think this is a very different way to think about educational spaces, about shifting who has the power. Is power derived from behind the lectern or in front of it, from behind the keyboard or on the other side of the projector screen? It is in part influenced by this idea that I've started to develop what I am calling the CRIP classroom. A classroom that is inspired and informed by the needs, by the experiences of disabled people, as opposed to designing normative classrooms that we have to adapt and change for non-disabled people. The idea, the dream, the goal of the CLIP classroom is to create a classroom that no longer requires accommodation because every student is accommodated without question that we treat the disabled and non-disabled students as having equal needs, both all deserving of accommodation to support their path through course concept, content. I think that accessibility is a little bit like a well-planned vacation. My advice to you, when you start to think about accessibility, can you imagine if you based all of your travel exclusively on what flights were available, what bus routes were available, what hotels were available, and you just went wherever the pathways would take you. That might be kind of exciting, perhaps, but most of us don't plan travel that way. We plan our holidays by saying, I want to go to Greece. That's the objective. And then we work our way backward. Must find a hotel in Greece. Let's see what options there are. Must find a way to get to Greece. Maybe it's a flight. Maybe it's, I don't think you would take a boat. It's probably a flight. <laughs> probably. I'm going to drive to Greece. <laughs> probably not going to work, um, but you'll have a great time on the East Coast. <laughs> I think this is what accessibility needs to look like. We think too much about the abilities that somebody has. We don't think enough about where we want them to end up. What is the outcome of this teaching experience? What do we want students to learn? And if our pathway to that end goal does not make sense, then we need to change. So I've started with the basis idea that I would like to create a classroom that does not require accommodation whenever possible. So I've started working on it. As soon as I see accommodation requests that start to come in, I start to change my class to say, well, let's change it so that everybody can benefit if they have this need, whether they've disclosed or not, whether they have dis, uh, any documentation or not. Let's try to change things. It is the idea that everyone has a right to access, but that access comes in lots of different forms, meaning there must be lots of different ways through your class. It is about encouraging creativity to find alternate pathways. One of the things that I've experienced the most, I would say, in my life as a person with a disability is that we disabled people are actually very good at finding solutions because if we didn't, we wouldn't be where we are right now. We are expert navigators. We are expert problem solvers because we could not be here if we hadn't generated solutions ourselves. Let's embrace that. Let's embrace that life with a disability means life of interdependency and collaboration. Let's bring that experience to our classroom. 
Let's help students to want to collaborate, to learn how to be better collaborators, to lean in to interdependency and not simply complain about group work. Let's reimagine the space. To do that, I'm going to give you three really quick examples about things that I've been doing differently in my classroom. Number one is the syllabus. The syllabus is, of course, the contract that you hold between yourself and the students. But we rarely think about the syllabus as an important tool for accessibility. Clarity of information, preventing information in different means is important. So I, for instance, provide both text-based outlines of when things are due, as well as very colorful chart-based things. Because some people need the text bullet-pointed list. Some people do better visually, with lots of different colors, things that are coordinated. I've started to think about the ways in which I assign assignments. When are things due? Are they due because of educational practice, or are they due because midterms are after reading week, final exams are before Christmas, final essays are due, what does the Senate say now? Not like a few days before the end of term, more or less. But if you have tenure, maybe they are. Who knows? <laughs> because that's how I did it when I was in university. So they should suffer as I have. <laughs> are we trying to suffer or are we trying to teach? Trying to develop, trying to learn. This means those structuring your lectures differently as well. Multimedia. Um, something that I've not done a great job of today, and I apologize, but I was like, one hour, I have so much to say. <laughs> using video, using audio, having lots of different formats of information, because not everyone learns best with what I've been doing to you right now. Some people need conversation. Some people need discussion. Some people need to read, to see, to hear in different ways. Lots of different ways of presenting information is critical. But of course, we need to think about access. Do not show a video if it is not closed captioned. Closed captioning is not just for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. I love captions. I have no hearing impairment. I use them all the time, all the time, in everything I can. It's on my TV, it's on my Netflix, it's on my Crave, it's on everything. Because I realized I was missing a lot of stuff in movies and TV shows by not having captions. You'd be shocked if you haven't done it before Watch a movie you love with captions on and be shocked that you may have missed a really funny joke because it was so fast, you just didn't hear it right. Play on words especially. Not only that, but they're getting very creative in how they describe like audio in things and it just adds another joy um, <laughs> to hearing things. Yeah, it's fantastic. Poignant music everywhere. <laughs> poignant music, poignant music. Very important. I think about the ways in which breaks are critical. That not only do we have very low attention span as humans, um, but we also have reasons that we need to get up and move around. That perhaps the student has to go to the washroom, that they need a break, they can't sit for three hours. So I structure my classrooms on 45 minutes, 15 minute, 45 minute, 15 minute, and 10 minutes early, 15 minutes ideal, if possible, sort of thing. Give people longer breaks. You don't need to just pound people with information for three hours straight. They're not getting anything after the first 15, 20 minutes, give or take. <laughs> you laugh, but I'm totally serious. And then you add in things like Facebook and all text, uh, cell phones and all that, they might not actually be getting anything. Um, <laughs> full, full stop, full stop. It's also though about thinking differently about the ways we engage students in classrooms. I've started getting students to do things like live tweeting during my class. Live tweet, use the hashtag, now you now have a combined note, a note that all students can benefit from. So maybe a student was sick, couldn't be there, they can still find out what happened in class collaboratively. I've also done things around uh, using a, a service called Note Taking Express in which I basically give transcripts to all my students. I do the lecture, I put the transcripts online. When I did that the first time, people were like, you're out of your mind. They're all going to ace the class now. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that would be so bad. It would suck if they learned. Um, it's weird. Great curve. Uh, so I did it, and I discovered that 80% of my students downloaded every single transcript I uploaded. 
my grade curve changed by 2%. That actually didn't fundamentally affect the end goal. It didn't actually make things better. But there were several students who said to me after the class that their grade went up about 15% from what they typically get. These were students who did not have any accommodations whatsoever. I've now been using things like Collaborate as well to provide the opportunity for students who maybe can't get to class to still be able to see and participate in class from home. Do we need students to be bums in seats for them to learn? Some do. I'm that person. I cannot do online classes. I'm terrible at taking online classes. I'm a bad student. Put me in a room, lock me in, turn off all the devices, I'll learn great. But there are others who don't need that necessarily. We need to have mixed models, mixed approaches. The last that I want to talk about is assignments. Um, exams are the worst. No one likes exams. Exams are terrible. But exams are also sometimes necessary. So what if we tried doing exams differently? I want to tell you about what I'm doing now for one of my classes, actually two of my classes now. I've now shifted to an online exam format in which midterms are done online through OWL fully. Fully open book. If they want to collaborate, they could certainly try, but I've designed it in such a way that that makes it kind of difficult. They have three hours once they open the exam. Of course, if they have additional time requirements, I just put that on and it's fine. But this way, everyone benefits from having a keyboard. Everyone benefits from the benefit of a computer because I doubt there are any jobs in this world in which you will be required to write by hand for three hours <laughs> off the top of your head. It's not like a thing. There's no benefit to that, I would argue. And then what I do is I say there is no fixed date. So the exam opens on Monday, and you have until the end of day Friday. Do it when it works for you. If you wake up on Tuesday morning and you're like, I am not in a position to write today, cool. Write on Wednesday, write on Thursday. Do it at the very last minute on Friday. That's what everyone thought would happen. Not actually what happened. But 20% of my students will do it day one. They're like, I'm ready to rock and roll, let's do this. Monday morning, they're done. They do it right away. Most of my students, like 90% of them, I don't know if I've just messed up my percentages. Yeah, I did, totally. So like 65%, most of them are done before Thursday. A lot of them do it on Wednesday for some reason. Seems to be the day. They're like, hump day, let's get rid of this. Um, in fact, in the three years I've been doing this now, I've only had two students do it in the last possible time slot. Only two. That's it. And what have I noticed? Far less accommodation requests. I'm not getting doctor's notes. I'm not getting, I'm overwhelmed. I'm not getting, I have another assignment that's due and I have to do it right now. Let the students organize their time. Organize their time around all the other things they're doing. It's better pedagogy. So I leave you then with three buckets to think about. Three principles that I think we need to consider when we look at the CRIP classroom. A CRIP classroom acknowledges that we are all individuals with different needs, wants, and desires. The CRIP classroom abhors the one-size-fits-all model because it operates from the base knowledge that we are all fundamentally different. No diagnosis is the same. No person is the same. And while there are lots of overlap with people with disabilities, we are not all the same. We encounter the world differently, whether or not we have a disability. We must design spaces then with this knowledge in mind. Yes, there is room for generalization, but no, people must not be forced to conform to these generalizations when they simply do not fit within that box. The CRIP classroom demands that we form spaces and content for as many people as we can, while at the same time being flexible in molding and modifying the world to fit those that fall through the cracks. I will likely never achieve my dream of an accommodationless classroom, but I'm certainly making my life easier by not requiring students to beg for my support. The current classroom then, of course, remembers that our mission as educators is to be to spread the word to all who will listen, not just those 
who are within earshot, and not just those who speak the same language. And I mean that in every way that you can imagine the word language. So my future vision, my vision for education in Ontario follows these three simple steps. And I should put air quotes around simple. None of this is simple, but we're worth the effort. I believe that we need, must design spaces that inspire our students, not spaces that are designed to impair them, to take away knowledge, to withhold explanation. I think that we must design spaces that accommodate, that aren't just designed to subjugate, to determine who should be here and who should not. And I believe that we must design spaces that reconfigure themselves to meet the needs and aptitudes of all students, to amplify their ability, to not merely focus on that which they cannot do. And as I said, this is not simple. It is hard. It is work. But in 1983, a young man was told, young boy, it was not a man then, <laughs> a, young, a child, a baby, if you will, <laughs> a baby was told that his life would amount to nothing, that he would be unable, that he would be disabled. I hope that as you listened today, I hope that if you ever uh, win the lottery and buy my book, <laughs> I hope, I hope that you will agree that I was worth the work. I hope that you'll agree that the student in grade 12 right now coming to Western next year is worth the work too. Because you give them the chance, they will exceed your wildest expectations. So good luck. And when you don't know what to do, I'm just across Richmond. We are not far away. And I don't have all the answers, but I like to cause trouble. <laughs> Thank you.